Hello everyone. Am I visible and audible? Uh, please give me a thumbs up if you think I am visible and audible. Thank you, GDPC. Namaskaram. Yeah. So today we continue with our session on image-based MCQs. There was one session yesterday, 4.30 to 5. And today we have the second session. Uh, so just to introduce myself, I am Dr. Resham Basani. I am a practicing dermatologist at uh, Bojani Clinic at Matunga. Uh, I was a faculty at KJ Somaya Hospital for 10 years. I left it in 2020 and now I am with an academy. Uh, I uh, am also a clinical research associate at BJ Wadia Hospital for Children. And my core interest is clinical dermatology and pediatric dermatology. I like teaching and hence I am here uh, so that I can transmit that passion to students. So, before I start, I would like you to know about the Iconic subscription. The Iconic subscription is where you get the best of an academy with the best of prep ladder. Uh, so, with an academy, you have live classes and batch courses with live tests and quizzes. And uh, on prep ladder, you have the video lectures with question banks and rapid revision courses. When you buy a combo pack, obviously, the price goes down. Okay, so you have a subscription for 12 months, you would pay around 4125 a month. For 18 months, it would be 3300 a month. For 24 months, it will be 2888 per month. And for 36 months, it comes out to be 2300 a month. Okay. And if you wish to go in only for the plus subscription on, on Academy, then uh, the Per monthly cost would be 4,500. If you take it for three months, it would be 3,750 a month. For uh, six months, if you buy, it will be 3,375. For 12 months, it will be 2,063. While for 18 months, it will be a very good price for 1,625 per month. So I would uh, request you to uh depending upon your preferences subscribe to the iconic subscription or the plus subscription and when you do so please use my code that is dr resham 10 and get a 10 percent off so with this uh, we begin uh, where we left yesterday so i'll be putting up a question i would want all of you to answer in the chat Yes. So this is our question for today. What typical morphological lesions are shown in the picture? Is it a pustule? It's a, is it a target lesion? Is it a nodule or a plaque? What is the typical morphological lesion that you see on the picture? Yeah. So Parag says it is B, that is target lesions. Anyone else? Durgesh says it's C. GDPC says it's a target lesion. Fatima says B. Sindhu says B. So we go with the majority. Yes, you are right. The answer is a target lesion. Okay, so what is a target lesion? A target lesion is also called as a bullseye lesion or an iris lesion. So, what you have in a target lesion is the central area which is showing uh, dusky erythema. Then you have a ring of pallor and then there is a ring of erythema surrounding it. So, that is the classical target lesion. In this picture, you can see they are bullous target lesions. Okay, so there can be variations in the target lesions as well. And please remember that target lesions are seen in cases of erythema multiforme. Okay, so erythema multiforme shows target lesions, iris lesions or bullseye lesion which typically has a dusky erythema in the center. Then there is a pale ring which is surrounding it which is suggestive of dermal edema and then there is a area of flaring that is erythematous flaring. Okay, so these are the three zones of the typical target. 
Now, erythema multiforme can be divided as either erythema multiforme minor or erythema multiforme major. Erythema multiforme minor is not associated with any mucosal involvement. There is involvement of the palms, soles and most of the times the lesions are just limited to the palms and soles. Okay. While in cases of erythema multiforme major, usually the lesions are more extensive. So, in addition to the involvement of the palms and soles, there can be other lesions on the forearms and the lower legs as well. And in addition, there is one mucosa involved. Okay. So, it is a self-limiting recurrent kind of a disease and each episode lasts for around 1 to 4 weeks. Okay, now please remember that when you are talking about erythema multiforme, it is most of the time induced by infections rather than drugs. Okay, so erythema multiforme is most commonly caused by infections. Drugs are only a rare cause of erythema multiforme. So, what infections cause erythema multiforme? The most common infection to cause erythema multiforme is herpes. Okay, so whether it is herpes, most of the times it is herpes labialis which you know allows this erythema multiforme to occur and the other infection seen with erythema multiforme is mycoplasma infection. Okay, so please remember when they ask you about erythema multiforme, the causative uh, reason is most of the times an infection. While if they tell you SJS10, the most common causes are drugs. 85% Eight, uh, of the times SJS and 10 are caused by drugs. Okay. The difference is that in cases of SJS 10, you do not get the typical targets as you get in erythema multiforme. They have a typical targets or they are also called as target toid lesions. So, what is the difference? The difference is that instead of these three zones, they have just this central dusky erythema and an erythematous flare. They, the target toid lesions or the atypical targets of SJS and 10, they lack the middle pallor, okay, the middle zone of pallor which is suggesting dermal edema is not present in cases of SJS and toxic epidermal necrolysis. So, what is the difference between Staph look, uh, between Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis, the difference is in the body surface area involvement. In cases of SJS, the body surface area involvement will be 10 to 30 percent, while in cases of toxic epidermal necrolysis, the body surface area will be more than 30 percent. Okay, in SJS, you have more of, you have of course mucosal involvement. So, there will be at least two mucosae involved and in toxic epidermal necrolysis as well, you have mucosal involvement and sometimes all the mucosae that is including the oral cavity, genitalia and the conjunctiva can be involved. Hemorrhagic crusting of lips is what you see in cases of toxic epidermal necrolysis and as I had mentioned yesterday, Toxic epidermal necrolysis exhibits a pseudo Nikolsky sign. Okay, so what is the Nikolsky sign? If you apply shearing force over normal appearing skin, you will see that the epidermis moves over the underlying dermis, which is the Nikolsky phenomenon. And when you apply the shearing force, you will be able to de completely detach the epidermis from the underlying dermis. Okay, so please remember pseudo Nikolsky sign is what you see in cases of toxic epidermal necrolysis. It is called as pseudo Nikolsky. Sana, yes, it is seen in pemphigus vulgaris as well, but it is a true Nikolsky sign. In cases of toxic epidermal necrolysis, it is called a pseudo Nikolsky because the separation of the epidermis from the dermis is happening because of the necrosis of the individual keratinocytes and not because of the damage to the desmoglenes.
ओके सो दैट इज वाइट कॉल्ड एज द सूडो निकॉल्स की साइन ट्रू निकॉल्स की येस यू कैन सी इट इन ऑल द इंट्रा एपिडोमल ब्लिस्टरिंग डिसऑर्डर्स विच इंक्लूड्स द पेम्फिगस ग्रुप ऑफ डिसऑर्डर्स एज वेल एज द स्टाफ्लोकोकल स्कार्लेट स्किन सिंड्रोम येस प्रताप यू आर वेरी करेक्ट इन केसेस ऑफ टॉक्सिक एपिडर्मल नेक्रोलाइसिस देर इज सूडो निकॉल्स की पॉजिटिव बिकॉज ऑफ द कैराटिनोसाइट नेक्रोसिस now let's go to the next question the most common triggering factor for this condition is i have given you the answer to this when i was speaking about the earlier question but nonetheless please do answer look at the picture okay so yes parag you are right sana you are also right and so is sushma reddy and fatima yeah this is a typical picture of erythema multiforme where you are lesion you are seeing the typical target lesions on the palm okay and the most common triggering factor for this condition is herpes infection drugs can also cause it but they are rare causes malignancies can also cause it but again they are rare causes the most common triggering factor is herpes infection so in such a case if you treat the herpes infection with a cyclovir your erythema multiforme should also disappear okay i think this all is always also covered only thing what you need to remember extra is that Kebner phenomenon is a rare cause in erythema i mean uh, sorry her uh, erythema multiforme is a rare cause of kebner phenomenon now what is kebner phenomenon kebner phenomenon means that the lesions of a disease they tend to come up at the sites of trauma that trauma can be either a mechanical trauma or it could be chemical trauma okay but the lesions will appear at the site of trauma so the common disorders which exhibit the kebner phenomenon include psoriasis lichen planus vitiligo rare causes include erythema multiforme vasculitis okay so these are uh, uh, these are uncommon causes of kebner phenomenon okay now let's go to the histopathology yes debashri panda has mentioned molluscum now there is something which is called as a pseudo kebner phenomenon pseudo kebner phenomenon occurs in conditions which are infectious yeah so what happens is because you scratch the lesion the molluscum virus that is the molluscum contagiosum virus it's a pox virus it gets auto inoculated at the sites of infection okay at the sites of uh, scratching okay and that's called as a pseudo kebner phenomenon as sana rightly mentioned it's also seen in warts so pseudo kebner phenomenon is seen in molluscum as well as in warts due to auto inoculation that's very good sana so tell me uh, where in which condition do you see reverse kebner phenomenon anyone yes navin you are very correct yes psoriasis is intriguing in which you see true kebner phenomenon as well as reverse kebner phenomenon yes nikki you are also correct so basically what is reverse kebner phenomenon it says that if you traumatize a lesion of psoriasis then it will disappear from that side okay so reverse kebner phenomenon is seen in cases of psoriasis very good okay now let's go to the histopathology of erythema multiforme uh, the histopathology of erythema multiforme will show the presence of interface dermatitis now interface dermatitis means that the <coughs> inflammation is occurring at the dermo epidermal junction okay so you have necrotic keratinocytes at the dermo epidermal junction and there is basal cell vacuolization now you need to know the conditions which are associated with interface dermatitis and basal cell vacuolization 
please remember lichen planus please remember discoid lupus erythematosus and graft versus host disease are the causes of interface dermatitis in addition to erythema multiforme okay so uh, interface dermatitis the causes include lp dle gvhd and em how do you treat treatment is it is self resolving because herpes is something that is self resolving so even the erythema multiforme tends to resolve but the problem is it's recurrent okay so if it is very recurring okay then in that case you can prevent the future hsv attacks by a cyclovir prophylaxis the dose of which is 400 mg two times in a day okay let's go to the next question you have a patient who presents with flaccid bullous lesions involving the oral cavity and the skin he she has a lesion as shown below in the picture acantholytic cells are seen on sank smear what is the most probable diagnosis so sana says and sushma says it's a that is pemphigus vulgaris yasir raja also says it's a that is pemphigus vulgaris and so does ashish so we go with the majority the correct answer is definitely pemphigus vulgaris okay so what is the clue in the mcq which is telling you it is pemphigus vulgaris one they have mentioned it's a flaccid bullous lesion okay that's the first thing second thing that they have mentioned it is involving the oral cavity as well as the skin and if you see the acantholytic and the zank smear is also showing the presence of acantholytic cells as well as if you see here on the screen on the picture you will be able to see that it's a typical flaccid bulla of pemphigus vulgaris right so what happens in pemphigus vulgaris is that there are igg antibodies which are directed against desmoglein 1 as well as desmoglein 3 so what happens is the, uh, the 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 desmoglein is the protein which is a part of the desmosome okay now desmosome is going to connect the two keratinocytes together the desmoglein 1 is present in the subcorneal location while the desmoglein 3 is present in the suprabasal location so what happens is that these igg antibodies they attack these desmoglein and destroy them as a result of which the desmosome gets damaged as a result of which you see that there will be a uh, disruption of the intercellular junctions as a result of which the keratinocytes will dissociate from each other and the keratinocytes will be uh because they get dissociated they will uh, lose their intercellular adhesions the shape of the keratinocytes will change okay so when the shape of the keratinocytes see these were the polygonal keratinocytes okay they were uh, they were adherent to each other through the desmosome now when there are anti desmoglein antibodies which attack this desmosome the keratinocytes will lose their polygonal shape and in fact they will turn into a circular shape okay and there will be accumulation of fluid in between them so this process of separation of the individual keratinocytes from each other is called as the process of acantholysis okay and these individual keratinocytes they become circular the nucleus becomes large and there is peripheral condensation of cytoplasm okay so these cells are called as acantholytic cells so when you do a zank smear what is a zank smear you you like suppose if this is the bulla if i deroof the bulla and then there will be an erosion under it correct if i scrape the base of the erosion and then i place that smear onto a clean glass slide and i stain it with gimsa i will be able to see the typical zank cells okay so these are the acantholytic cells you can see the cell has become larger it has become rounded as you can see the nucleus has become larger and there is peripheral condensation of cytoplasm so typically this is an acantholytic cell occurring in a patient of pemphigus vulgaris okay 
and please remember that as sana has rightly mentioned in pemphigus vulgaris you have uh, affliction of both the desmoglein 1 and 3 while in cases of pemphigus foliaceus there is affliction of only desmoglein 1 now desmoglein 1 is not expressed in the oral cavity so in cases of pemphigus foliaceus you do not see the involvement of the oral cavity okay so that is why you this patient cannot have pemphigus foliaceus because they have specifically mentioned that the oral cavity is involved secondly in cases of pemphigus foliaceus because the antibodies are targeted towards desmoglein 1 which is situated in the subcorneal location the placement of the blister will be subcorneal so the roof of the blister will be formed only by the stratum corneum hence the blister is going to be very very fragile and hence in cases of pemphigus foliaceus sometimes you may never see bullae or vesicles you will just see crusted lesions and scaly lesions and these lesions will be more so distributed in a seboric distribution okay so hence pemphigus foliaceus is called so because foliage means leaf right foliae foliaceous means leaf like scales so because in pemphigus the bulla is very fragile it you most of the times end up seeing just crusting and scaling and hence it's called as pemphigus foliaceous nikolsky sign of course will be positive in cases of pemphigus foliaceous sana it will be the bulla spread sign which will be difficult for you to do because the because of the fragility of the blister so bulla spread sign you cannot perform in cases of pemphigus foliaceus but nikolsky sign will definitely be positive okay bullus pemphigoid would have shown tense blisters okay so that is why in uh, your they have specifically mentioned as well as shown in the picture that they are flaccid blisters right so it cannot be bullus pemphigoid in cases of dermatitis herpetiformis the lesions are going to be distributed on the extensors that is on the elbows they are going to be distributed on the knees and the lesions are going to be very very itchy okay so pruritus is not at all mentioned in this scenario and nor the lesions look like those of dermatitis herpetiformis hence it is also ruled out now Let's go to this question. Identify the diagnosis based on the DIF findings. Is it pemphigus foliaceus? Is it bullous pemphigoid? Is it epidermolysis bullosa simplex or is it pemphigus vulgaris? Yes, Sana, you are right, and so are you, Sushma. Yeah, Yasir, you are also right, and so is Karthi and GDPC. Yes, Sana, you are very right. It is a fish net appearance. So basically, what happens in cases of pemphigus vulgaris is you see the position of IgG and C3 in the intercellular location, and hence, as a result of which, the fluorescence is accentuated in between the keratinocytes, and that gives rise to the that gives rise to the fish net pattern. Okay, so. this is very characteristically seen and confirmatory in cases of pemphigus vulgaris in cases of pemphigus foliaceus you will see the fish net pattern but it will be very superficial it will be just limited to the area uh, uh, below the stratum corneum here you can see it is extending down so it is supra basal in uh, nature okay hence it's unlikely to be pemphigus foliaceus in cases of epidermolysis bullosa simplex as well as uh, sorry epidermolysis bullosa simplex please remember that the dif is going to be negative because it is a congenital blistering disorder okay because it's a congenital blistering disorder there is no antibody formation so in cases of epidermolysis bullosa simplex uh, where you get uh, blisters on the trauma prone area since birth okay the dif is going to be negative in cases of bullous pemphigoid the dif is going to be linear uh, at the dermo epidermal junction so there will be igg and c3 deposition at the dermo epidermal junction in cases of bullous pemphigoid okay so 
करेक्ट आंसर हेयर इज के इज पेम्फिगस वलगैरिस ओके इन केसेस ऑफ लीनियर आई जी ए डोमेटोसिस द इट विल लुक लाइक बुलस पेम्फिगॉइड दैट मीन्स इट विल बी लीनियर अलॉन्ग द डोमो एपिडोमल जंक्शन बट देर विल बी आई जी ए डिपॉजिट्स इंस्टेड ऑफ आई जी जी डिपॉजिट्स इन डर्मेटाइटिस हर्पिटी फॉर्मिस द टिपिकल पैटर्न इज फोकल ग्रैन्युलर आई जी ए डिपॉजिट एट द डर्मल पैपिला ओके Uh, in cases of bullous systemic lupus erythematosus there is a linear homogeneous or non homogeneous deposit of multiple immunoglobulins c3 and fibrin at the dermo epidermal junction so can you tell me which are the conditions uh, which are the vesicular bullous disorders in which you will get the immunofluorescence negative anyone we discussed one that was epidermolysis bullosa simplex correct because it's a congenital mechanobullous disorder there is damage to the keratin uh, 1 and 5 correct so you find that the uh, dif is negative okay please remember that you will find the dif to be negative even in haley haley disease as well as in cases of darius disease because they too are congenital uh, they are uh, hereditary disorders okay yes sana dairy uh, sana is right parag is also right and uh, the answer is ebs heli heli and darier these are the three conditions where you will find that your uh, direct immunofluorescence will be negative the reason being that they are not associated with any immune uh, pathology okay there are no abnormal antibodies formed in these conditions okay so rest of them whether it is pemphigus group of disorders or bullous pemphigoid or epidermolysis bullosa acquisita okay uh, you will have the dif to be positive please remember epidermolysis bullosa acquisita is a condition which you see in adults okay and and this is an acquired condition where there are auto antibodies which are targeting the collagen 7 okay so in epidermolysis bullosa acquisita your dif will come out to be positive and you will see a linear deposition at the dermo epidermal junction okay but uh, in cases of epidermolysis bullosa simplex junctionalis and dystrophica you are going to see that the dif is negative in these conditions so also you need to remember that in cases of epidermolysis bullosa and bullous pemphigoid the dif is going to be the same okay you will see linear deposition of igg and c3 at the dermo epidermal junction in both these conditions the way to differentiate it on dif is by doing a special technique which is called as the salt split skin technique in cases of in uh, the process of dif and that will be able to differentiate between the two so that's all the time that we have today with uh, with this i would like to conclude the session and uh, i hope uh, it has been some learning for you with that i would just like all of you to get reminded about the iconic subscription uh, which is uh, an aca an academy with uh, prep ladder subscription uh, with an academy you have live classes and batch courses live tests and quizzes while with prep ladder you have video lectures and rapid revision courses when you have a combo offer the cost comes down substantially especially when you get it for 36 months uh and uh, with the plus subscription which is only an academy subscription you oh, when you take it for 18 months it's hardly anything per month okay so i think one should subscribe to this to get a lot of uh, interactive live classes tests quizzes batch courses and structured schedule i am very sure that it will help you to get prepared for your um, upcoming neat pg very well okay so with that i take your leave see you soon bye and please do use my code dr resham 10 and get a 10% off please follow me on an academy so that you have updates about the special classes coming up and uh, i will also be launching my course shortly so you will be updated about it thank you very much